Okay, Gaithal Omar, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, and having this conversation about some important topics that are going on today in the world. Uh, the big news when it comes to, I'd say, Israel and, and really um, Middle Eastern uh, politics that have, that have happened recently is the Israel-UAE deal. Um, would love to hear your thoughts of it. You, depending on what media sources you read, it's a it's a complete game changer. Uh, according to some sources, it's a, you know it's no big deal. It's a farce. It, so interested to hear what, what how how significant do you think this is, and what could be the possible ramifications? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I look, I mean, the UAE Israel deal is certainly a huge deal. Um, it's not insignificant. It's not a sham. It's significant both in its own right. I mean, you know, uh, these two countries uh, have established uh, what could be a very different sort of Arab-Israeli peace. Uh, unlike Jordan and Israel, unlike Egypt and Israel, the two countries never had a war. And I think they don't have the baggage and both are forward-looking countries. And I think there's a lot that they can build on this. But beyond the bilateral, and that is at the core of this deal, it also has regional ramifications. Regional ramifications in the sense that uh, it did break a taboo um, that until now has really not been touched. Uh, it might uh, start a chain reaction, uh, not necessarily an immediate one. I don't see anyone else coming and normalizing soon, but at least it started uh, a process. It tells us a lot on about what's happening in the region. It tells us, you know, why did the UAE and Israel get into this? They did because there is a, a confluence of interest. There is an overlap of interest, whether it's Iran, whether it's countering terrorism, extremism, uh, etc. It tells us that the Palestinian issue, while by no means irrelevant, is no longer the top issue in the uh, regional uh, agenda. But it also tells us something that's almost counterintuitive. What is ultimately a bilateral relationship and a, and, and a deal driven by bilateral interests, yet nevertheless felt that it had to have a linkage with the Palestinian issue. And if you look at how the UAE in particular is messaging, especially to an Arab audience, but also to an American audience, the linkage with stopping annexation, things of this sort. So I think this is a microcosm of a new region that is still being shaped, that uh, it's still very hard to define, but it's one that is very, very different from, say, 20 years ago. You know, it's interesting. Obviously, um, the United States had a big part uh, in, in this happening. Um, and this uh, uh, tomorrow is the um, or this Friday is the is, is 9 11, which I guess, you know, we, we would look at in some ways as, as a low point of Western Muslim relations. Um, do you think things have changed significantly? Um, would a deal like this even been possible? you know, 18, 19 years ago, how, how do you see those trends, both in the Israeli-Palestinian context, but maybe the greater, the bigger um, sort of Western Muslim context as well? Maybe let me start with the big picture and zoom in. Uh, look, I mean, you're absolutely right. 9-11 symbolizes the low point in the relation between the two uh, civilizations, I guess. Uh, I don't like to use big uh, categories yet, uh, uh, look, it was beyond being a low point, I think, for many in the Muslim world, certainly in the kind of pro-Western uh, uh, part of the Muslim world, uh, the pro-American part of the Muslim world, it was a wake-up call. I think uh, there was a sense of dismissiveness before 9-11 about some of the more toxic religious uh, education and messaging. And by the way, a dismissiveness that was not only in the Arab world. A dismissiveness that was also in the United States itself. I mean, there was, uh, say, with Saudi Arabia, very deep military relations, energy relations, and people were willing to turn a blind eye on some of the uh, negative interpretations of Islam that were being pro uh, propelled. I think this 9-11 was a wake-up call for many of these countries. And since then, we started seeing a, you know, a degree, at least, of, first of all, introspection in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, an attempt to rectify some of the uh, old problems. And we started seeing different messaging. Um, I'm sure many of you, the, the, our audience, are familiar, for example, with Sheikh Mohammed al Isa, who is the head of the Mos uh, World Muslim League. This is a Saudi uh, uh, organization. Anyone who was of age and, uh, during 9-11 will remember we talked about madrasas and all this radicalization in religious schools. This is the organization that was leading that. Today, the head of that organization visited Auschwitz, 
clearly says the Holocaust is uh, one of the uh, uh, you know universal tragedies that we need to uh, acknowledge and uh, reckon with. Um, he is one who's telling Muslims living in the world, in the West, to respect the laws of the West. This is something extremely different from what we uh, had before. The changes we're seeing in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in terms of opening up to the world uh, and all of these things, this is by no means a finished uh, work. This is a work in progress, and one can point out to many remaining uh, issues from both sides, by the way. Yet, at the end of the day, I think what we started seeing post 9-11 is a completely different uh, uh, approach and a realization in the Muslim world and in the West that these are issues that we have to address. And here I have to give credit, a lot of credit, to President George W. Bush, who seized the moment, who understood that there was a moment for partnership with uh, our Muslim and Arab allies, and not a divisive moment. On the Palestinian-Israeli issue, you know, 9-11 uh, might not have had a direct impact, but the course that it set the region and the world definitely impacted the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. On the one hand, I think post 9-11, one could not equivocate about terrorism in any way, shape, or form. Pre-9-11, and that's not only a Palestinian issue, this was a regional, wide regional issue, Terrorism could be dismissed as uh, resistance, uh, things of this sort. Post 9-11, zero tolerance for this. And I think this is something that many Palestinian leaders, at least Yasser Arafat at his time, uh, failed to grasp. And, you know, uh, I think the new, the current Palestinian leadership is aware that this is a different uh, world. But also what 9-11 showed is that there is a set of common challenges facing the West, the Arab world, Israelis, Arabs uh, together, which go beyond the, the Palestinian-Israeli question. Traditionally, in the Arab world, the Palestinian issue was the uh, conflict. When you used to talk about the, uh, the, you know, the Middle East conflict, it was very clear what we were talking about. Post 9-11, terrorism came out as a joint uh, global uh, threat. You know, Bahrain is facing the same threats uh, from some of the Iranian proxies that Israel is facing from Hezbollah areas of confluence of interest. Uh, then, of course, the long road to the Arab Spring and what came after the Arab Spring, collapse of states, uh, emergence of Iran. All of these issues pushed the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, to a much lower priority. Now, there are many who would uh, claim that it has made it irrelevant. I do not agree with this point. I think it is still relevant, certainly for countries like Jordan and Egypt, which are directly impacted. But also, again, as, as mentioned before, the fact that the UAE chose to link its normalization with Israel, with stopping the annexation, tells you that this issue continues to have resonance in the region. So interesting. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the idea of sort of the bigger scope the, the, and then zeroing in on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict i think there's a there, there, and i don't know if this is a misconception i guess this is my question there's a conception that in the muslim world um i think the united states and israel are linked you know we have heard quotes the big satan and the little Satan." is that is that accurate i mean obviously the muslim world is very wide but is that is that an accurate sentiment and and has it changed do people uh see the us and israel so in the muslim world linked so so closely or 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 not and again has that changed over time um i'm going to give you an impressionistic anecdotal point of view obviously uh, i'm not uh, very aware of the polling uh, beyond that but certainly there is this perception uh, there is this perception and one that is frankly fed by the fact that the us and israel have a very strategic relationship and every president Democrat or Republican, uh, you know, Obama or Trump would call it uh, ironclad, no daylight, all of these issues. And of course, the Arab world hears that and, uh, uh, um, you know, re re responds to it. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there is a differentiation. And the example that you gave, big Satan, uh, small Satan, that's a very Iranian uh, language. I mean, this is specifically uh, Ayatollah Khomeini who used that uh, language. Uh, the Arab world has a much more different, uh, uh, nuanced one. I mean, I look, for example, at a country like Jordan. Uh, and, and you can have this example about many other Arab countries. Yes, Jordanians and many Arabs might not be happy with uh, the way that uh, US and Israel uh, are allied and how the US supports Israel and everything. Yet at the same time, the same Jordanians would understand that their relations with uh, the U.S. 
their contradiction with the US is key to the country's survival. The same with the Egyptians, the same with uh, almost any Arab uh, nation. So I think while there is uh, a degree of, of uh, uh, identification, there's also a degree of uh, differentiation. Now, a very uh, interesting counterintuitive point, and this is maybe not in terms of the street, but in terms of at least uh, elites and decision makers, is that uh, one of the things I believe that has led to the UAE deal with Israel, but beyond that, you know, the very thinly veiled uh, secret covert relations between Israel and many Arab countries is a sense, both in Israel and in traditional U.S. allies in the Arab world, that the U.S. might be abandoning the region. You might remember uh, President Obama talking about uh, pivot to Asia, President Trump talking about, uh, you know, this, this whole uh, forever wars. And there is a concern among Arabs and Israelis, that the U.S. might be abandoning the region. And this, counterintuitively maybe, has brought them closer together. Interesting. You know, it, it's, it's interesting in, in the U.S., um, there's no doubt that support for Israel, there's strategic reasons, there's military reasons, but there's a, I think, a core feeling, you talk about shared values, right? People talk about, you know, um, Judeo-Christian value. There's a sense that that the that that in America that's why Israel supported. I'm wondering what you think about you know th this newfound relationship, like you said, between Israel and Muslim countries, and a lot of it is clearly based on strategic interest. There's also also a lot of commonalities in, in how we look at the world, and 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 I wonder, do you, do you see? Is there a chance that that idea of shared values, that idea um, of, of common values is something that could expand to Jewish Muslim relations. I know again, your, your expertise is in the Israeli Palestinian conflict, but I don't know if you see that at all or see that, 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 that this can go beyond just a strategic relationship. Um, look, I mean, in terms of specifically Jewish Muslim, it's not something that I can speak for. All I have to say is that I do see a lot of very serious, very serious attempts, uh, between, in the U.S., but beyond the U.S., between Muslim and uh, Jewish scholars to actually have a serious interfaith uh, debate. And by that, I don't mean that we sit together and eat hummus and, uh, you know, sing kumbaya, but actually learning about the jurisprudence and uh, the theology of each side, dealing with very difficult uh, issues. So I see that happening. Now, would that translate into a people-to-people -people relation between Israel and the Arab world? I am skeptical. I am personally skeptical. Uh, I still think that there are many different gaps in terms of worldview, in terms of orientation. The Palestinian issue is still one that is very uh, resonant. Uh, yet, uh, I think what the UAE deal shows us is if there is promise for a warmer peace that is built not only in uh, on you know concrete interests uh, but on values, it is probably the Israel and the UAE are probably the prime uh, candidates. Both are countries that pride themselves at being innovative. Both are countries that pride themselves at their very close relationship with the United States, entrepreneurial, uh, technology-driven, uh, and all of that. So that would be a fascinating uh, uh, case study. A lot will depend on how uh, the leaders of both countries, will they be a hostage to their fears and concerns? or uh, the traditional ones, or will they take some risks? At the end of the day, you know, uh, when an Emirati uh, uh, investor uh, flies into Ben-Gurion, will they get uh, the uh, negative Ben-Gurion treatment, or will they be treated as a welcome uh, uh, innovator? When an Israeli goes to uh, the UAE, will they be uh, confronted with what about the Palestinians or will they actually focus? On... So a lot, I think, you know, is not set in stone, but this is a relationship that is the one that I think is most likely to be the one that uh, can show us, if not shared values, then enough commonalities to go beyond the kind of cold government to government piece that we've seen so far. You know, it's so interesting to me because when you talk about those shared commonalities of innovation, um, you know, of technology, of, of business. And, you know, the video, I don't know if you saw, but there were videos going around this week of, um, I assume, UAE officials that had visited a synagogue in uh, dur during, uh, it must have been in the recent time, and you had these very orthodox Jews and these UAE officials, they sheikhs, I don't know, they were dressed in very traditional Muslim garb and they were singing together and dancing together. Mm -hmm. 
you know, literally hand in hand. It was such a powerful statement, a powerful visual. But in the context of what you just said, which is that these are actually two countries and two peoples in a way that are very innovative and very modern in a way, that contrast of the traditional and the modern, maybe those two things together in a way are the commonality as well. Like that could be a very deep, uh, a deep, a deep relationship. So, you know, I want, I want to ask you a lot, I think times in these issues, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, Muslim-Western issue, there's a lot of misconceptions, mm -hmm. a lot of misconceptions about the other. And I really see it as, you know, Israelis, Palestinians, and, and even Americans, they all have different misconceptions about each other. It's very different. I think Israelis look at Palestinians probably different than Americans do. Um, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that, that are preventing us from moving forward even more, creating peace between the Israeli-Palestinians? The, the misconceptions Israelis have, maybe the misconceptions Palestinians have, and misconceptions Americans have. Um... Let me start with a thread that goes through all misconceptions. And I think, and I've, I've, you know, I've seen this throughout my career and my personal life, always an assumption that when someone from the other side says something you disagree with, they do this not out of genuine belief or whatnot, but out of malice. To give you an example, I mean, uh, for me, when I started my engagement with Israelis as a negotiator in my uh, old days. My first assumption when an Israeli tells me that, uh, you know, the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, uh, Har Habayt, uh, is that they have a very strong connection to it. My initial um, reaction, my gut reaction, was always they're doing this to undermine my own connection to it. They don't really believe it. They're just saying it as a as a, a talking point, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we all go to defensive uh, positions uh, that uh, do not allow us to understand that while we may dis might disagree, at least we have to accept that the other uh, side comes from a genuine place of belief. Now, it could be a belief that uh, is irreconcilable. Uh, it could be a belief that's based on uh, poor education. It could be many of these things. But I think our willingness to immediately jump towards assuming bad faith is one that I've seen on all three parts and beyond as one of the key issues. I think, look, at a core level, the core misconception, I think, between the two, at least Palestinians and Israelis, relates to the issue of their connection to the land and their national identities. I think fundamentally, you know, there are many, many political differences, borders, security, these kind of things. But fundamentally, I think many Palestinians do not understand the Jewish connection to the land. How deep that Jewish connection? I can tell you, it took me a long time to internalize how strongly the Jewish people feels uh, towards uh, this land. The fact that, you know, Jews are indigenous, not uh, a colonial project. I think we see a flip on the Israeli side, almost an ongoing attempt to kind of question the genuineness of Palestinian national identity. Um, there is no such thing as Palestinians. They're just Arabs. You know, the whole famous Golda Meir uh, uh, statement, which finds its three iterations in, in many different ways. So if I want to talk about, uh, you know, the biggest hurdle, I think the biggest hurdle is our constant attempt to undermine the basic fundamental narrative uh, of the other side. And from this flows all of the suspicion and all of the misunderstandings and the inability to, I think, resolve what should be resolvable issues. You know, th this uh, we're leading up in the Jewish calendar, the time of Rosh Hashanah, which is really a time of introspection. I think you mentioned introspection earlier before. And, and so much of, I think, politics is based on these assumptions that people come to the table with, like you said, you yourself had. And, and, and I think it's a testament to you that you've been able to break out of those uh, um, of those assumptions through introspection. But do you do you think that um, do you think that you know, the, the UAE and Israel, the Israel deal, um, some people feel that actually can, is going to tear the Israelis and the Palestinians further apart, where many people feel that a certain pressure on the Palestinians realizing um, that there might be a different reality happening and this could actually bring them closer together. This seems to me this is a time of introspection. For, for the Palestinians, mainly, the, the world around them, I think, is changing so dramatically, and they can look at it as very negatively. Do you think there's a chance that this can be seen in a positive light to actually move the sides together? Um, 
look, I mean, first of all, to be very clear, I mean, change is difficult. And I think for the Palestinians, both the people and the leadership, to internalize that they're no longer the center of the region, that they're no longer the top priority, is not something that's easy to internalize. Uh, it takes time. And I think especially when this, this is shown in such a shocking, uh, jarring way, uh, you know, the Israelis and the Emiratis are going to be uh, in the White House next week. Uh, that is the emotional side. Sometimes is very difficult. Uh, I mean, we ignore it in politics, but so much of our political behavior is based on our emotional uh, response. Um, whether or not it will be help the Palestinian-Israeli issue um, depends on many factors. First of all, it depends on the Palestinians themselves, as you yourself mentioned. Uh, and here, until now, I don't see any introspection on the leadership level. Um, I don't expect to see it in a week or two. I'm hoping, and you know, when I talk to some Palestinian officials, I know that they that they understand they need to think about it, but I don't think they have gotten yet to a point where they can think creatively about it. I remain hopeful, but you know, it remains what uh, who knows what the future will bring. But also uh, depends on uh, uh, what the Israelis and the Emiratis how they will play this. Uh, so far. I am not, uh, how shall I say it, particularly uh, thrilled with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's spin on this. You know, reinforcing the point that this makes the Palestinians irrelevant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rather than trying to find a way to bring them uh, on board, it's almost, uh, you know, rubbing uh, salt uh, uh, in the wound. Um, it depends on whether or not the Emiratis themselves uh, want to make this into an issue, or do they want to kind of uh, only focus on the bilateral. And here, I would point out that the two Arab countries that have had peace with Israel in the past, Egypt and Jordan, both ended up being very constructive actors in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, both in bringing Israel uh, along, but also in certain points in pressuring the Palestinians uh, to move along. And finally, it depends on the wider Arab world. And here, Saudi Arabia is the leader. Will they take this, take this development and take the linkage that the Emiratis and the Israelis basically codified and build it into other uh, uh, aspects of the relations? Will we see a new Arab policy that says, you know, partial progress on the Palestinian-Israeli front will produce partial normalization with Arab countries? Significant progress will produce significant normalization. There is a way of creating a virtuous dynamic where progress on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, track could actually trigger progress on the Arab-Israeli track, not in the old all-or-nothing approach, but in a gradual approach that creates clear incentives for both sides to move uh, forward. So I don't believe there is a determined way forward. This could very well end up being a disaster for the Palestinians, but I can see very credible paths that this can actually revive what was so far, frankly, a dead peace process. Hmm. Do you think there's a disconnect at all um, or, or a different sense on the street than there is amongst the pal politicians? Uh, your average Palestinian who's watching what's happening are they looking at it differently, or do you feel it's the same, the same sort of disconnect, or the same reluctance to to um, to change or to move forward? Is that limited to the to the leaders, or do you think that's on the street as well? Um, look, I, I think the the feeling of abandonment, even I would even say betrayal, uh, it's certainly felt. I think among the majority of Palestinians and the majority, whether the street or the leadership. You know, when I, uh, some of my colleagues and friends came out in support of this, uh, many of our social friends came out and basically, you know, were not very happy with this. So I think this is this is a common sentiment. Yet I think what this highlighted, and again, this is a sense that I've gotten from speaking to Palestinians, you know, business people, uh, academics, uh, friends and peers and colleagues. It highlighted the failure of the Palestinian leadership to conduct the Palestinian uh, issue in a constructive, pragmatic way. I think, uh, and it's it's no secret, I mean, you just look at the polls, uh, there is a sense among Palestinians that the leaderships have failed. They have failed in diplomacy, but they have also failed in governing. Um, and this, this uh, uh, UAE-Israel uh, uh, deal has brought many Palestinians to ask themselves, what has led us to this point? What has led the Palestinian issue to become so marginalized? And they blame their leaders. Naturally, they blame uh, their leaders. And I think uh, while initially there is a, a unity of purpose when it comes to anger against this, I do uh, think that uh, once the emotions calm down, 
people will ask their leaders, why did you get us to this point? And what do you plan to do about this beyond rejectionist uh, hyperbolic uh, statements? And I guess my last question will be just, and what about on the other side? Do you see on the Israeli, the Jewish side, um, what, what, would you, what would be your, your, your number one piece of advice in order to move peace forward um, on the Israeli side? Um, I would say uh, abandon triumphalism. I think uh, I've seen this uh, mainly from, frankly, politicians, but uh, I've seen it uh, on social media and even with some conversations with Israeli uh, friends. There is a sense that, look, we've won and the Palestinians have lost. Look, my deep belief that at the end of the day, the Palestinians and Israelis are fated, doomed, blessed, call it what you will, to be living in close proximity and they will be intertwined. Um, and ultimately, a defeat of one of the other side would one of the sides would only hurt the other side. Neither side is going anywhere, and I would say celebrate this uh, event because it's worthy of celebration. It is a breakthrough. But at the end of the day, for Israelis and for Palestinians, if we do not find a solution, and to my mind, the only solution is a two-state solution, separation. If we don't find the solution, this conflict will not disappear. And my worst, my worst fear is for this conflict to be morphed from political conflict that is very difficult and complicated but ultimately solvable to an identity uh, conflict, to a religious conflict that then becomes unsolvable. I fear that the idea of a two-state solution collapses because that is a threat to Palestinian nationalism but also a threat to Zionism. So celebrate but don't be triumphalist and I think look in the longer term and see how we can leverage this to moving the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, not necessarily towards final resolution, that's not going to happen uh, anytime soon, but at least uh, on the uh, move it to the right trajectory. Beitha Omer, thank you so much for joining us. Really our honor, and we learned a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.